Welcome to this latest video on reviewing our November mocks and I imagine a few of us are disappointed about how it went but bear in mind this is November of the year going into the exam we still have a lot of road left to go we've got seven or eight months and in that time we'll have a lot of past paper practice and particularly these kind of questions these nine markers and twelve markers so I'm not going to go into the details about how to answer this particular question. I've actually got the mark scheme on the next page for us to review. But really I want to talk about how we go about answering these questions. How to go about answering them. Well, uh, what will always happen in these type of questions is that we're provided with a scenario and we're also provided with the context for that question. So our scenario is this. A software company decides to release a duplicate file finder, so a little utility software called deduplicator. This duplicate files uh, files are found. Sorry, duplicate files are files that are exactly the same, bit for bit. So uh, they're exact match for each other. Uh, space is often wasted on computers by having multiple versions of exactly the same file. So why would you have nine different versions of the same PowerPoint you downloaded? And duplicate file finders are programs that find and identify duplicate files on the hard drive so they can be removed. If they're giving you a scenario, it's important to think about that in the context of of, of the question. Okay, so we've got. We've got a software company, let's say deduplicator, so it's not a hugely complicated bit of software, um, but it is something where, you know, it's going to be cost sensitive, so thinking about different ways of developing that bit of software, the complexity of it's not too high, so it would be easy to easier to understand the, um, the context of what the, or the success criteria, what they're trying to look for, uh, and also it looks like they are their own client here although ultimately they'll have to do some understanding of what end users are looking for for it to be competitive. The software team that produces Deduplicator decides to make a new version. So this is a, an update to a previously created one that can detect duplicated images the previous version could not. Okay. The software team must decide which methodology they will use for the project. So this is not about how they're going to make it. This is about the software design philosophy they're going to use to get there. And one of them is going to be, some members of the team ex uh, suggest extreme programming, while others prefer to use the waterfall cycle. Now, what we'll have to make sure to get the marks is that we're going to have to identify the two um, elements, the two things we need to discuss. And those two things are quite clear. What are the two things we need to discuss? Extreme programming and the waterfall cycle. We you need to make sure that you are talking about both. If you're only talking about one of those things, you're going to limit yourself to being in the bottom um, the bottom mark. So the way it will be, because this is out of 12, will be 1 to 4, 5 to 8, and uh, 9 to 12. And if you only talk about, say, the uh, extreme programming, or you solely talk about waterfall cycle, you're going to be in the bottom, even if you do it really well. So you need to be making sure that you're talking about what you know about extreme programming and waterfall. And then I talk about K, whoops, I talk about K's, uh, I put K's and I talk about A's and then eventually about an E. K standing for knowledge. And we're talking about knowledge. This is what we know about uh, waterfall methodology, irrespective of the context. What do we know about waterfall technology? Well, we know it's about uh, going through a series of processes where you go in one direction that generally what you want it to be is the nature of the problem is quite small and easy to understand so that you don't have to go back to readjust it. If you do have to go back, you have to restart the whole process. This is all knowledge, right? There's more you could say, all knowledge. At what point have I applied it to this context? I have not. Same with extreme pro uh, programming. We're talking about it being a focus on things like pair programming, on rapid prototyping, on uh, it all being focused on actually the programming element. There's less involvement. There's potentially uh, uh, less... Um, documentation that might exist to support it, etc., etc. Again, all knowledge. What you have to do then is then make sure that you've got application and application to what? Scenario. So what we're looking for is a discussion on both extreme programming and the waterfall, waterfall cycle. You could do it discussing all you know about extreme programming, applying it to the context, all you know as in all the knowledge about waterfall cycles, applying it to the context, or you could have it, you know, backwards and forwards about, you can talk about both at the same time. Either way is acceptable. And then fundamentally, you have to end up with an E, and the E is the, what are you trying to evaluate? There you go. So you need to have this as a whole discussion that leads to this eventual evaluation that justifies which you would recommend. 
Okay, that is the journey of every single one of these nine and 12 markers. Nearly always you're provided with two things. Sometimes it's three, but it's nearly always two. Here's a, here's a question you could get, considering we've just done this. Uh, um, um, Timmy would like to sort some items for his, sort, sort the list of his users in his social media website. He's having an argument with Bobby and they were trying to discuss whether they should use bubble sort or they should use quick sort. So we've got our two things, quick sort and bubble sort. We'd say what we know about them. So you talk about the time complexity, you talk about uh, the effect of time complexity on the size of n. And because you're talking about that, you'd have to be thinking about application. So it would depend on how many users in the social media website they want to implement, right? So that's the whole conversation, and eventually you come up with an evaluation, and evaluation would be probably something like, uh, if there are any substantial amount of users, I would always strongly recommend QuickSort, because in QuickSort, it scales because it's got an n log n time complexity, right? You, know, you can imagine there's a whole conversation that goes like that. So you're thinking, of your two things, what do I know about it, irrespective of context? How can I apply it to the context? And then finally, evaluation. All right, I'll shut up now, right? That's the general things. Here is the mark scheme, what it looks like. Now, I've got it on a TV where it's almost impossible for you to see, but at a later point, you would be able to. And if you're watching this right now, I'm sure you can. Uh, what are we looking at here? Well, here's what we're looking at. On the left, these are the bandings. So a low, 1 to 4, medium, 5 to 8, high, 9 to 12. So it's almost like a best fit. It's not like there's a mark scheme where you just tick off. Having said that, it talks about the knowledge, the sort of things that you'd expect to be talked about sort of application expect to talk about and finally how the evaluation might pan out and uh, like I said one to four the candidate demonstrates a basic knowledge of methodologies with limited understanding shown and the material is basic the candidates make a limited attempt to apply the acquired knowledge so even here you're applying it but you're not doing it very well I mean, if you don't apply it at all you're really I mean I might be in general for some people right if you're not applying it at all I mean you might be on the lower end of this uh, how do we get to a higher mark? Well, the candidate demonstrates reasonable knowledge and understanding of both methodologies, i.e. you are discussing both and you're talking about what you know about it. The material is generally accurate but at times underdeveloped, i.e. you know there are things that you didn't bring into it, knowledge that could have been discussed that you didn't bring to bear. Uh, the candidate is able to apply their knowledge and understanding directly to the context, although one or two opportunities are missed. So it's the degree to which you manage to apply it. You're applying it, you identified some of the knowledge, but you didn't apply it as well as you could have. Uh, uh, evidence examples are for the most part implicitly relevant to the explanation, and the candidate makes a reasonable attempt to come to a conclusion about showing some recognition. So there is an evaluation here, and it is reasonable. This is still this is quite a reasonably high bar. So you have done knowledge in both. You have applied it, but you didn't catch maybe as many as you'd like to have caught. That doesn't mean that you need to talk about every single thing here, although realistically, if you want to get to the higher bands and the higher of the higher bands, i.e. 12 or 11 out of 12, you are going to want to try and hit as many of these as possible. Um, something I would say is on the mark scenes for these things, they do exist out there, so it's an opportunity to practice in the future. And then to 9 to 12, thorough knowledge and understanding of both methodologies. What do we mean by thorough? It means that you've hit a lot of these. Uh, the material is generally accurate and detailed. The candidate is, and also you did it correctly, um, the candidate is able to apply their knowledge and understanding directly and consistently to the context provided, i.e. you're demonstrating application of the knowledge. Uh, the candidate is able to weigh up both sides of the argument, which results in a supported and realistic judgment as to which methodology should be used. That's your evaluation. In some ways, it's not rocket science. What's difficult to do is actually being very clear about what these knowledge and applications are, these bullet points, okay? So uh, in red, these are all your knowledge. It's an opportunity to make, this is the sort of thing you can maybe make flashcards out of when you come back to it to make sure you're really clear about what some of these things are. And then it's application. Okay, well, how did they use this knowledge to actually apply it to the context? And then we have two different types of evaluation. Why do we have two different elements? Well, because... Yeah, you could actually, even though you might think, well, extreme was the obvious answer, or waterfall was the obvious answer, as long as you're defending and have a logical structure to your argument, 
either will be acceptable, okay? I'm not gonna talk through every single bullet point here or every single thing. I mean, I think this is a great opportunity for you to pause or for, like I say, I put it on SharePoint for you to have a look at and have a look at those things. Okay, uh, let's start having a look through these pseudocode type problems. As I was just saying to you guys, actually a lot of your answers were pretty damn close. A lot of it was a little bit of syntax about how to access things, a little bit of logic missed, can make all the difference. So let's first of all make sure we understand the nature of the problem. So we've got this, which are all these uh, places where you can take flights and uh, you've got these different locations. And the idea is you wanna go from Reykjavik to Dublin, it's 260, but then if you wanna go from Reykjavik to London, I think you have to add up all those trip costs in between. So if I wanna get from Reykjavik to Rome, it'll be 260, 190, 650, 210, although or it could also be 109, 150, depending which way you go. In fact, we'll be doing that with pathfinding, but I digress. Uh, the trip cost, though, the actual order is recorded in this data structure. What do you think this data structure is? Array. An array, absolutely, okay? And it's saying that you start in Dublin, then you go to London, then you go to Paris, then you go to Rome, i.e. you start here, there, uh, there, and there. And it wants you to total up the price of this trip. How is it going to do that? Well, it's saying that there's this function. Oh, I should have done that as a question, really. It's a function. Why is it a function? Because it returns a value. We send it the two parameters, Dublin and London, and then it returns the price. So Dublin to London is 90. Why can't I just send then, if I want to go from Dublin to Rome, why don't I just send it Dublin and Rome? Um, it's yeah, it's not going to do that for us, is it? There's no direct. If there was a direct flight, I guess it would work. It's saying that you have to do all these hops on the way. So we've got something that's recording all our different uh, uh, destinations on the way in this array. And we've got this function that tells us the individual cost of each of these jumps. And then we just have to do the straightforward thing, I say straightforward, of actually connecting this up so that we can actually get uh, the total price. So uh, let me just zoom in a little bit. That's not what I'm looking for. So we need to write a program in the language or pseudocode of your choice, it's quite flexibility there, that uses the cities array, I, that array there that you'll be sent, to calculate and output the cost of a given journey as a monetary value. In this case, it would be 950. So in the, i.e. the case for it to go from Dublin to Rome is 950, but this will obviously should work under all contexts. So for some people, they might think that you want to write a subroutine. It hasn't asked you to do that. It's just asked you to, because um, it could have said, uh, please generate this as a subroutine that takes in a, an array as an argument. It's not asked you to do that. It's just asked you to uh, use this array. What's the name of the array? Cities. Cities. And this function here, trip cost, to get it. So I'm going to want a variable to start off, right? Because what am I going to want to do from the off? So we're going to want to have a variable that we use to keep track of the cost, uh, setting it to zero. Hey, what data type do you think we'd use? It's a tricky one, really, because it's like a currency or money data type would be good, but that's not one of the standard ones. But what we would might use is we could either use maybe an integer for pounds and an integer for pennies, but that would be how many variables? Two. A double or a real number, yeah, might make sense, yeah. Although, of course, then you might end up with, like, you've got a hundredth of a pound, but then you might end up with a thousandth. So, anyway. So, let's declare that variable. Well, that's a solid first step, is it not? Now, what would, do we need to do? Well, let's, before I, write the, before I write the code, let's think through what is it we need to do. We have an array with all these destinations. I need to take the, uh, the destinations from this array in pairs, feed it to the function. What's the function? Um, Trip cost. Trip cost yeah. As I go along, and then have this total be added to it as I go along, right? As I'm stepping through this loop, do I know how long the array is going to be? Yeah. Well, it could vary, but once I'm sent the array, I now know the length of it. So I can't, I can't say, like, I'll just add them up manually, because maybe there's four destinations, maybe there's eight destinations, maybe there's three. So whatever I'm doing, I have to use what in the array? So it's lot length. The lot length. I agree with you. So... Because we know how many times we have to go around, what kind of a loop are we going to use? For loop, For loop right? Because if we use a while loop, it's when it's logic controlled, and here is a count controlled, so let's do that. Uh, let me discuss this. For a for loop, I'm going to need a counter, something to keep track of it. And a common one that people use is i. i for index. Do I want to start at the beginning of the array? Yes. 
So I'll set it to zero. And then this is the pseudocode, a way of writing it. And then you say two, and you say, what are you going up to? What am I going up to? Well, we're saying the name of the array is cities. And then uh, let me say dot length. So it's going to go right to the end. Now let's take a moment to see how that's going to work. OK, let's do that. So let's think about the array we've already been given. So Dublin is at what position, what index position? Zero, right? London is at one. Paris is at two. And Rome is at three. What is the length of this array? So the length is four. Now, typically, when you're using the length of something and you're using a for loop, the reason why you won't go up, you often do length minus one, is because if you're going to the last item, it will be three. So if i goes up to four and then you start accessing it, you see you go array out of bounds. So it's very typical to do length minus one. But let's think about what we're going to be feeding it. First time around, in fact, we can do that right now. What's the function we're going to call to get it? Trip cost. So trip cost, we're going to have to send it trip cost. And then let's think about what we need to send. Yeah, what's the? Pr we have to send it the two destinations, don't we? That's the whole point about trip cost. So the first one we'll have to send it is uh, is the one at zero and the one at one. Uh, let me just write that out. Because cities is an array, to access an index in the array, we have to use square brackets. And then uh, what I discussed is we're going to send it the first one, and then I'm going to send it the second city. And some of you at home or in the classroom right now are thinking, what is he doing? I'm trying to make a point. Um, so the first time this is going to run, I will be zero. And then trip cost, it would take Dublin and London. And then I'll have to do something with that, probably add it to its total. But let's part that for a second, because it's going to be at position zero and position one. Then I will become one. And then which ones we will look at? We're always going to be looking at the first two, isn't it? Because it doesn't matter what I is doing. It's still going to be looking at one, and it's going to do it four times. So that's not what we're trying to do. We want to be actually using our index to make the change. So what do I want to change it to? Exactly right. So we want to change this to the first one to be i. So in this case, because it's i zero at the beginning, that will be zero. And the other one will be i. And we want to go plus 1. OK, now in here is the reason why we got a massive problem. Eventually, i is going to become what using my for loop? i is going to become the length of this array, which will be 4. So it will be cities at position 4, so here, and cities at position 5. So typically, what you do for these kind of problems right, is that you take away, what do you take away? Typically, you take away minus 1, so you go to the end. But let's say we did that this time. Then it will go up to 3. So we say cities at position 3, which would be Rome, and cities at position plus 1, which would be 4. So that will also be out of bounds. So that's why we need to back up 2 this time, because we're going plus 1 on here. So let me just fix that for you. In fact, uh, where were we? Brilliant. So it's going to go the right amount of times. In this context, again, length is 4, so it's going to go up to 2. So i is 2, so it's going to go to Paris, and then it's going to be uh, 3. So it's going to go. To, the last one is going to be the right destination. Uh, let's think, what do we actually need to do with this? We need to record it. We need to store the value. So how do we do that? We can do total cost equals trip cost plus total cost. So in this cost, I'm not, I'm not going to call it total cost. Why am I going to do that? No total length. Yeah. From my context, I've got total. So I've got, so I need to, right now it's going to go through and it's going to generate this, but what am I doing with the value? Nothing whatsoever. So I just need to make sure I store this. I'm going to indent inside the for loop to make it uh, more readable. Is equal to total uh, plus the trip cost. Right. Now, is that going to work? Yeah. Uh, the pseudocode, uh, which we've got missing at the moment for here, is that for a for loop, the pseudocode was actually the command is to go next uh, i. i++?
Yeah, because and yeah, I think that's yeah. Look, the, the, this one here is saying in pseudocode or language of choice, what we're looking for is the logic. So I think in N4 you'd be all right, you would be. But the, on the pseudocode it says to do next I to, to terminate a for loop. But I think if you did N4, it's clear what you're trying to do. You're saying it's the end of the scope of it. Are we finished? No. So where do we put that print? Do we put it inside the for loop or outside the for loop? Outside. outside. If we put it inside, what's going to happen? There we go. So let's say do that printing. Now I can put total in there. What? How can I make that a little bit nicer? Oh, customer journey would be even nicer. I'm like meeting it halfway. So I'm putting the pound sign, beautifully drawn, plus what? Nope, total. Yeah. Uh, the next question we've got here is not a programming question per se, but while we're here, why don't we do it? In fact, I think I said this in our lesson last week. When we look at an array and something like a linked list, what's the first thing we want you to think about from now on? What is it? Static data structure versus a dynamic data structure. I feel like I've said that. <laughs> I would launch with a dynamic versus a static data structure. I haven't got it printed out, but I've got it right here in front of me, so I'll let you know. So it's saying for a linked list is a dynamic data structure, one mark, an array is static data structure, one mark. Okay, well, let's park that. What's the next thing you could say? Well, you could say an array can have any element accessed directly. So you can go to a direct index. To get to a linked list, can you get to it directly? No, you're going to have to go through all the pointers. Remember, that's how a linked list works. You've got individual nodes, and then you have to follow the pointers up to get to the place where you want to be. Um, the contents in an array are stored in memory contiguously. Do you remember what contiguous means? Yeah, one after each other. But remember, a linked list, the whole deal was the stuff in the memory didn't move. The pointers moved. So uh, whereas the contents of a linked list uh, may not be, uh, may not be. So we have a continuation of our last question. Uh, and on the left, I've got kind of like the original. And now on the right, I've got the new question. So let's have a quick read through it. It says, each airport has a three-letter code. There we go. The airline system stores the airports and the corresponding airport codes in here. So you've got the code, and then you've got the name of the airport. Uh, what data structure is this? 2D array. 2D array. In a programming language or pseudocode of your choice, Write a program that takes in an airport code and finds and displays the airport name. So you put in RKV and finds and returns Reykjavik. Uh, you can assume a 2D array called airports, so that's the name of our array, has already been declared. In fact, you know what? I'm going to do this a solid. There we go. Has already been declared and populated with the data above, seen here. Uh, there is no need to validate the input, so because otherwise people might do it wrong. Uh, and you can assume that the user will only enter a code that exists in the array. Okay. Let's think about how a 2D array works. A 1D array, a one-dimensional array, has an index. One index to find it. Because it's two-dimensional, I now have... Yeah, I'm going to have two indexes, right? Uh, I actually disagree with the mark screen on this one. So I've got 0 and a 1 here. And then going down this way, I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, seven, eight. In two ways, I disagree, disagree with the mark scheme. One way, it actually index from one. Uh, also, it index is, uh, I think it doesn't include, I'm trying to remember now, I don't think it includes the code and name as part of the array. But does it specify that the code and name is not part of the array? It does not. So we have to assume it is. Yeah. So uh, let's start off with what we actually know. What's the first thing? What, what are we going to have to do? Yeah, we're going to need the user to actually input. Uh, sorry, I misremembered. Here's what it does. It says uh, position 1i, so i going this way, is what they're doing for this direction. 1i is the code, and 2i is the name of the, uh, of the airport. So that's 1 and that's 2. Is that 1 and 2? No. Only if you index arrays starting at position 1. And the mark scheme, the mark, not the mark scheme, the pseudocode guidance says it starts at zero. God knows what is happening here. Some, in some program languages, it does actually start at one. Uh, but no one's we're doing. So the first thing we want to do is that we want to ask the person, don't we, for um, to please enter the, the airport code. So I'm going to do that. And then we want to input it and store it in a variable. So I'm going to do that now. 
Okay, so um, some people in the audience who are playing along are saying it should be string airport code. Now, that's because you've used Java, and Java is what's called a statically typed uh, program language where you have to state the, the data type when you declare a variable. Uh, other things are dynamically data typed, and in the pseudocode for OCR, they do not require you to state the data type. Now, if you do declare the data type, will you lose marks? Absolutely not, but you, it's not required. So what's the command I'm going to want to do here? <laughs> Ultimately, I could have done this in one line, but because we come from Java where we have to like ask it and then import it, I did it this way. Ultimately, this bit could go in there, couldn't it? And we can ask it in one go. All right, we've got the airport. What's next? All right, we're going to go through this list in a for loop. So where do I start? And where do I go up to? Eight. Well, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is another place where I disagree with it because it actually goes from zero to seven. So it, what it's, it's saying is that this is not part of the array. But at what point does it state that this is not part of the array? It doesn't. Yeah, what can you do? Do a for loop then. And we're going to use a identifier for it. And I'm going to use i again, short for index. Why not? Start at what position? There you go. Uh, now, normally, what we do is that we say we go up to the array, the length of the array, which is airports dot length. Why can't we do dot length on a two-dimensional array? So, because it's a two-dimensional array, we don't know what way we mean by dot length. So, we're going to have to specify. And I'm saying the i is going to take us from zero down to eight. Again, it didn't specify that code and name is not in the two-dimensional array, although on the mark scheme it does imply it. So, we're going to say it's going to go up to eight. Beautiful. Now, the question is, um, what do we need to do as we go along? Well, we're going to have to go through here and do what? Like, talk. Let's talk about it before we write the code. What we're trying to do? So, we've taken in the airport code is equal to what? No, not the code. I'm not saying not the code. I'm saying talk about it without looking. Don't just read off. Good tip from the audience. Uh, is that um, I said start at zero, but of course starting at zero will be looking at code, and it's never going to be code. So you're very if you'd wrote that to start at one, that would also not only would it logically work, it would be slightly more efficient. I mean, it's at the margins, but you know every bit helps. Um, so what we want to do is we want to go through here. We're going to compare airport code in a selection statement, so in an if statement, to see if it's the same as what's in airports square brackets because it's an array. At position i comma yeah zero what's in that first bit there okay now the debate is do you put the uh this axis in the first or do you put the y-axis in the first right which way around and ultimately as long as you're consistent is what really matters now what they should do and they normally do is they say um lisbon is at airports position three comma one or one comma three and then they let you know which way around it is uh, unfortunately, on this one, they haven't. <laughs> it's not a great question in some ways, right? But ultimately, I'd give you the mark either way, because as long as you're consistent. So in here, let's say we've got... Uh, so what we say with selection statements, so we're going to write an if. Uh, where were we? So if uh, airport code, so the one that the person typed in, not a single equals because a single equals is for is for assignment yeah single equals for assignment uh and definitely not on our phone and double equals is for comparison what's the name of the array airports and yeah this is the syntax now oops let me make that less ugly uh this is the syntax now for accessing it so it's going to be square brackets and uh, the question will be yeah do you do this way first or this way first like i say it should give you a question as a heads up to sell you which way they're using it let's say we're going to do this direction first right so which which one are we in zero i've just put a thing through there to make it really clear i mean a zero or not oh it's probably not necessary but i'm a bit extra um and then for this one, so that's so we're always looking through this column. And then for here, 
we're not going to put in one, two, three, four. What we're going to put in, I absolutely. So if it is a match, what do we do? All right, it, it, right. It, it could go either way. Ultimately, people write it differently. As long as you're consistent in how you use it, if you think about it, it's it's all just relative. It's like we're in the northern hemisphere, so we are like we're standing on top of it. So people in Australia, they must be falling off the bottom of the earth, right? <laughs> but it's just you know, as long as you're consistent. But like I say, normally what happens in one of these questions, it actually says to you, uh, uh, Prague is in arrays. 1 comma 6 or in 6 comma 1 and it tells you and unfortunately they haven't done the good graciousness to done that for us so unless maybe it did it in an early question we've cropped it out it's possible you know but as in like I don't have all the questions you know what I mean it might have been an early one um, okay great so what do we do yeah we use an if statement and now we, if, so if we find it we go here so what do we do so what are we printing There you go. That's the that's the important bit, isn't it? Is that we're what are we accessing? Airport. Airports again. I suppose I could have made this nicer and said the airport you're looking for is. But I've not done that. What do I do different here? One, One and then what's the next thing? Um, I. Comma, I. I. Do we need to do an else? What happens if we haven't found it? If we haven't found it, what do we do? Nothing. Nothing. So you don't need an elf. Yeah? For for the syntax for a for loop, do you remember I said it earlier? What was it? The pseudocode syntax. Yeah. Now what you should do is you should do end if. Why do we do end if? Because in this context, we need to say where it begins and end. In uh, Java, remember you do that with curly brackets, you say where it begins and ends. Uh, in uh, Python, you do it with the indentation. If you don't put end if, how many marks are you gonna lose? Probably none. I mean, it's just like, it's nice to do the syntax. So let's aim to do the right thing. And if we don't, if we miss out little things like that, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but obviously if we end up missing out things like, yeah, not referencing the array, then let's not do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. But like I say, because you might slip on something that does matter, then if, like, if we try to, here's what I should do. Like, let's aim high to try and match the syntax as closely as we can, then hopefully the things that we might forget are things like that and not, you know, like is if we aim at just getting the bare minimum done and then we forget some of those things, then we're, you see what I'm saying? It's like a philosophy for life. Okay, finished? And normally you don't put print inside a for loop, but why is it not a problem this time? Well, there's only gonna be one match, right? I'll leave this on for a bit so you can have a little look over the mark scheme. Um, like I say, it's on SharePoint for you as well. But if you're on the video, you can come back and have a look at it, as you can see here. But, you can, but also, it's, well, it's good to see where the marks come from for some of these things. Oh, and the mark is here for static versus dynamic data structures. I lied to you, but not on purpose, by omission. Okay, so object orientation. And as um, I should do as a reminder, for paper two, when we do the real thing, two and a half hours long, 140 marks, and there's two sections, section A, section B. I've forgotten what the split is. Don't be intimidated, it'll be fine. Section B though, I'm just planting seeds for the future. Where it works is you're given a scenario. So in this case, it was like a lizard game, presumably. Sometimes it's like Monopoly, but you can't call it Monopoly because it's trade written. So it's like, I think one was like an animal farm version. You'll get there, it's so weird when you get there. And it, it can't even do connect four, so it was like four in a row. So you have some kind of like game that you're used to or some scenario you're used to. And then you have a succession of questions linked to that scenario, okay? And what the problem can be is actually you have to read like a page or two to understand the context. And obviously the problem is that you're in an exam when you're feeling nervous as anything. So trying to like think calmly is tough. However, the other thing I was gonna mention is that invariably it will make heavy use of object orientation. Now that might seem intimidating, but here's some of the things. You will nearly always get a question where you have to write getters and setters. How easy is that? Yeah, you nearly always have to write a constructor. And these ones are like three marks, four marks from all sorts of places, right? So there's actually, although it might seem intimidating, yes, when we get to like, how do we actually reference each object, it's a little bit tougher. But a lot of it is you get the syntax right. There's actually a lot of easy marks to pick up. So let's have a look at this object orientation question to get started. 
So we've got the lizard class. Uh, Livid Lizards is a computer game. Sounds fun. In which players get to uh, get fires lizards from a cannon uh, to knock down walls. Players get to pick different types of lizards, each with qualities and special powers. Ooh. The game is coded using an object oriented language. Below is the code for the lizard class. So all it's here. Uh, they're using indentation, you can see. And the name of the class is lizard. And they've made that clear by calling it class lizard. When does it end? At the end class. Uh, what do we call these? These are, and what do we call uh, that? Nope, the which, where's the constructor? This one, that's the constructor. Takes in these parameters and then sets these. Uh, the, all the attributes are set to private. Why? Um, data, hiding. data hiding, encapsulation, yeah, encapsulation or data hiding. And the way you access them will be through, which must be made public and they have to be made public in this context here though uh the constructor is here it'll have to be made public because if it was made private what would the problem be when you initialize the object you wouldn't be able to set any values which is kind of a not good um in this case it's been set all the values could you also just say size equals five do i have to actually take it in as a parameter value no i could just set it as a value if i wanted to okay so method it's got one method three attributes one constructor beautiful Identify an attribute. Well, we already played that game. What is an attribute? Speed or mass or size, all equally good. There you go. That's a nice easy mark. We'll take that all day. Lizard is a class. Describe what is meant by a class. Okay, now a lot of people, the question was actually, most people got a mark is whether you got two marks or not, right? So I think I've re referred to all these things before, but we're just not like match sharp. We're like, we're match fit, but we're not match sharp. Okay, because we're not getting answers exactly where we want it to be. So I think I've discussed um, the idea of a template or blueprint. Yeah. So you get one mark for just saying, in fact, let me make it so it's more in line. Template. Just saying the word template, that gets you a mark. Uh, and then what does it define? What did we say was inside it? Yes, there you go. Define methods and attributes. Guess what? That gets you your next mark. And then, what do we use the class ultimately to make? Because remember, the class hasn't got state because it's a template. We use it to make, there you go, use to make objects. I mean, the fancy word is instantiate, but you don't have to write that down. Used to make objects. There you go. I bet you everybody in this room knew all those three things, right? Right? It's just a question of whether we can actually, we just need to be that, that you know, I'm using that analogy about being match fit versus being match sharp. Like, you know the stuff, but you need to be practicing enough to get the questions and we get the answers exactly where we need to be. Okay, moving on. Describe what is meant by the term inheritance. So you've got polymorphism, encapsulation, and inheritance are the three principles that sit behind object orientation. Inheritance. Inheritance. So let's talk um, some of our language. So you've got parent class and subclass, or you've got superclass or derived class. Yes? Child class. Um, so where have I got here? I've got... Um, so one they used here is that they're saying inheritance is when a class takes on, what does it take on? What does it take? It takes, there we go. Inheritance is when a class derived or subclass or child class takes on the methods and attributes of its, no, it's super class or parent class. Yep. Okay, yeah, and just looking over this, where's the marks coming from? A class that takes on the uh, methods. Ooh, that's ugly. I'm not sure that's much better. Uh, it takes on the methods and attributes of parent class, right? Those are your three marks right there. You might call it the super class. Yeah? Uh, that, as far as I'm concerned, that's equally acceptable. It's not on the mark scheme, but if I was marking, I'd give it. However, since it's not the mark scheme, maybe we should say parent class. And also says the inheriting class may override some of these attributes and methods, because that's polymorphism, and may have some additional extra methods and attributes of its own. 
in a sense, if you inherit and you don't add any, do you change the class, or you don't override one of the methods, or you don't add in any methods, what was the point of inheriting? Because you're just going to inherit a clone. You might as well use the original. Uh, explain one way that the game developer might use inheritance for livid lizards. So this is like an application type question again, isn't it? Of like, how can we make use of inheritance? Well, I guess we're thinking about in your game, you have a special type of lizard that could have its own, that could be, have most of these methods, but maybe override one of them, such as break block. Maybe it's got more firepower. Remember, you've got to come back to, the, they've given you a class, they've given you some scenarios to try and tap into it. Maybe it have some, it could have an additional attribute. Maybe this one's like an invisible lizard. Use your imagination, I don't know. Camouflage, don't they do that, some of them? like. No, I think of chameleons, aren't I? Yeah. Well, it's just, yeah. Well, they, they can't say that. <laughs> and then the game uses, and then we've got, uh, and we'll come to the mark scheme. It's on the next slide. Uh, the game uses a 2D graphics library. Explain why a linker would be used to, used, uh, to be used after compilation. Remember, compilation, lexical analysis, syntax analysis, code generation, code optimization. Then you've got your object code. Is that ready to run? No because it needs to be linked to libraries, potentially linked to other uh, object uh, code. And then you've also got loaders, and you need to be specific about how they actually put it in position, uh, ready to be loaded in RAM, in contiguous locations, a program counter ready to point at it. So those linkers and loaders were like these things that we sort of tapped in at the end. But then if it comes up as a question, because you did a lot of work on lexical, syntactical, and I'm going to be honest with you, okay, that's a classic nine marker as well. Talk about compilation, the stages of compilation, right? But we also have to be ready for these type of questions. So is what I'm going to do. I'm going to save you the hassle of having to listen to me talk it through. I'm going to show you the mark scheme. So uh, on here, we've got, we talked about inheritance, but we've got the company may wish, so this is why different types of um, inheritance and the application of it. Company may wish to use inheritance to create different types of lizards. Using the lizard as a base class and different types of li lizards inheriting from it, I would say also, you know, apply it to the context. It's got that, it's got that bit, isn't it, when he shoots blocks or whatever it is, and you could say it could be a more powerful block shooter, or maybe it could affect the ability to block. Like, the more you can apply it to the context, the more it makes it look like you know what the hell you're talking about, even if you don't. It's about what it looks like and what it is. Uh, and then finally, this one over here about linkers, right? Uh, so remember, this is the point where you've compiled your individual code but it's not ready to run because the li you've borrowed graphical elements from a, from a library. And so the user running the program will not necessarily have the library installed in their machine. So, because they might have to, it might be from an online resource, who knows. Therefore, the relevant code needs to be included with the final executable. How does it do that? Well, it's the job of the linker to combine those codes together. So it's saying that basically when you're compiling the code, you've got your object code, but it's not when you've compiled it, it hasn't necessarily put that code inside the code you want. So it links to this other bit of code, this library that's pre being pre-compiled, and then it combines it together. I feel that this is quite a tough question as well, because it's three marks, and you have to be basically writing what they're looking for. There's not much wiggle room. Normally, like, it'd be nice to these kind of questions where there's actually four marks worth, and then, um, you know, you might get three out of the four, but this one you have to basically say pretty much exactly what they're looking for. I mean, it does say up to three marks for a valid explanation, but then you're kind of leaning on the marker or the examiner to be understanding enough that you've made a valid point. So, truthfully, there wasn't actually that much of this question connected to the little my computer. You have some of these right now where actually you have like a good 10 marks connected to it. But I think it's really good for us to come back and look, look, look at little man computing. It's the kind of question when it comes up that like has a sinking feeling a little bit if you haven't done it for a while, which is why I put it in there. Because I think it's really good for us to come back and make sure we're ready for these type of questions. So the program was shown in figure two. It's written in assembly code using the little man computer instruction set. Hey, what kind of processor do you think the little man computer is? It hasn't got many instructions. Risk reduced instruction set computing, right? Because it's only got like 10 instructions uh, in this instruction set. And uh, because it's risk, we know that each instruction runs in a single processor cycle, which means that it's amenable for pipelining. Yeah? Seeds for the future. 
Yeah, CISC is that each instruction, you can have things like multiply, may take multiple processor cycles. So you might, I, I was all about the linking. Uh, so we've got a bunch of here. This is our instruction, and this is the value we're applying it from, otherwise known as in an instruction. Nope. Nope. What part of the instruction is the actual command bit? Mnemonic. That is a mnemonic. So uh, on the left, you'd refer to this in an instruction as an opcode, and the value you apply it to is the operand. Now, that is at the level of an instruction of ones and zeros. Now, are we at the level of ones and zeros? No, although it's low level, so we're getting pretty close to it. And so what we do in um, a little man computer and in assembly language in general is that instead of writing the ones and zeros, you write a well-remembered mnemonic this is not learning for right now, this is planting seeds, right? So that you write a mnemonic, so that's there. And here you can use symbolic addressing rather than write ones and zeros. Because actually num b isn't a value, it's an address in memory where you find that value. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the question. In fact, uh, assembly language, where do we start? Top of the bottom, middle, where do we start? Of course we do. Imp, do you remember what that stands for? Input. So that will input and the value will be stored in what part of the processor? The accumulator. So the accumulator is going to be storing it. How long is that going to store it for? Not very long. And how many things can the accumulator store? One thing. So we need to put that somewhere, don't we? So it's going to store it in num a. Now num a is actually going to be address in memory defined here. So that'll be a certain number. Uh, remember, this is direct addressing. So it's going to then put the value in the, from the accumulator into number a. And then we're going to input, and that value, what will happen to the original value in the accumulator? It will be overwritten by this one, absolutely. And then that will be stored in num number B. So num A is going to store the first value, num B is going to store the second value. What happens next? Sub. Uh, the value currently in the accumulator will be num B, because that was the last thing we did. So when we start, when we sub num a, that means that the calculation we're going to do is something along the lines of num b minus uh, num a. Okay? So it's the second value, take away the first value, my point being. Like, sometimes it's worth going through it, make it concrete. When I say sometimes, it's always worth going through it, make it concrete. The more you can actually, like, run it through, the stronger your answer will be. BRP, if positive. Is zero positive? Zero or higher, so that means that if it's if it's branch if positive, that means that uh, it will go if number b is bigger. Because if that was eight and that was seven, eight take away seven as positive, so it's going to be if eight was bigger. So it goes not a. That's going to load a and it's going to load number a. So it will tell you which. It will tell you the smaller value. Uh, if it if if number B was 6 and number A was 8, 6 take away 8 would be minus 2. Is that positive? No. So therefore, it will come down to this. Load number B. So it will take uh, 6. So it will take the smallest of the two. Okay? The smallest of the two. What is the goal of this? Output the higher of the two. I think we're starting to see a bit of a problem and then branch always quit. So if we get here, it's going to go quit, and then it's going to finish it, and it's going to output the value. If we branch positive to A, we'd have been here anyway. So we'd be quitting. Okay, so when we come back... So uh, let's have a look at the questions. Uh, the question here is on uh, the type of assembler. Uh, a low-level um, a low level programming language, in this case, assembly language, which little my computer is, it will be converted into machine code by using an assembler. High-level languages, uh, that will be either using an interpreter or a compiler. Uh, so this will be an assembler. So uh, in this case, number A is 6. Number B is 4, 6. At this point here, B is what's in the accumulator. So we'll have 4 in the AC. And then, uh, because that's number B, and then number A will be taken away from it. So A is taken away, so which will give you negative 4, take away 6, is going to give you negative 2. Is that positive? No, so it's going to load number B, which is number 4. So it's going to be the wrong way around. What's the fix? 
Yeah. So either we could take in the um, numbers the other way around. So you could take in number B, then take away number A, and then the value be the way around. So this would be four. Uh, we could have it uh, the last one here being what's in the accumulator. Or in here, and this will be the easiest one, is change that to be not A load number A could become not A load number B. Yeah. And I would say, to make it more meaningful, I would say, you know, ch change, it, change it over here. But yeah, certainly that's number B, and then that will be times number A. Does that fix our problem? Yeah. Yeah, if you switch them over, that fixes our problem. Underneath it, it just says the program does not work correctly. Describe what the program actually does using the numbers 4 and 9 being entered as an example. A bit like what I've just done now. All you need to do is show what number A is, number B is 6, and then step by step throw, show what actually happens by applying the logic to it here. I don't actually have the mark scheme on the other side here. However, as I say, it's on SharePoint. You can go back and have a look at it there. But essentially what it's asking you to do for the two marks is just walk your way through. A bit like a trace table, but with these values here. Okay, uh, now we had the low-level language version of it. Now we need to be able to do it here in procedural language. By that, means sequence selection and iteration. The program can be written a high-level language in pseudocode, write a procedural language that takes in two numbers and outputs the higher of them. So how are we going to write this? Well, we just need uh, the two values being inputted, don't we? Right, this question here, easy money. What do we need to do? We basically need to identify the parameters that are involved in here. Uh, what are the parameters? Well, we've got a function. What's the identifier for the function? I mean, what's the name of the function? No, nope. what's the name of the function? It's called S. They're not doing very good meaningful identifiers because it should try to indicate what it's all about, and it's not. How many parameters does it have? One, two, three, four. Our parameters are A, the square brackets 0 to n1 is some way of actually calling which one's going into it, but the actual parameter is a. And then the next one is value. Then we've got low. Then we've got high. Believe it or not, those first ones, they're the easy ones, hopefully. The question then is actually to be able to interpret what's happening in here to figure out what high, low, and value and a actually are. And that's where people sort of came apart a little bit. So let's have a look at the function. So it's taking in these values. If high is lower than low, then return error message. Okay. Does that tell us what high and low do at the moment? Not really. Mid is low plus high divided by 2. Ah, now when we're trying to find a midpoint, I've actually not looked at this question yet. But places where you find a midpoint, considering what we've just done, what sort of situations do you do a midpoint? Yeah, kind of searches, right? We do, don't we, to find a halfway in between? Um, uh, so it's a low value and a high value, and then A at position mid. So low and high, if we can imagine, like A is clearly an, what do we think it is? It's an, which, yeah, it's a list or an array of some kind, isn't it, that's holding things. Uh, and clearly to me, low and high are indices, right? So areas to actually find. So it's not actually values, it's positions in an array. So if you've got, you know, an array of values here, low is not actually one of the values that's held inside it. It's actually, you know, either 0, 1, 2, whatever. It'd be some position. Why do we know that? Well, because here... When you had low plus high divided by 2, it's got this thing called mid, and then mid is a position. So if, let's say low was 0 and high was 5. 0 plus 5, 2.5, divided by 2 into a mid. 2.5, if it was an integer, becomes 2. Then A would be looking at that position here, the midpoint. All right, okay. So what does it return? Well, it returns... It's calling... What's happening here? It's calling itself again. A function that calls itself otherwise known as a, a recursive statement, okay? And what's it sending to itself? It's sending itself the same four parameters it had originally, so it's recursively calling itself. Um, and then in here, it's saying it's sending the value. So the value hasn't been... Have we established what the value is? 
No, but it's saying, you see the difference in here, mid was a position. Is value a position or is it an actual value in the array? What do you think? 50-50 chance, but you got it wrong. Um, yeah, and a thing in an array. How do we know it's a value in an array and not a position? Let's have a quick look at it. A mid, and I'll get my, let me get my little drawing, my beautiful drawing back. A at square brackets mid. So, in fact, let me make it concrete. Let's say low was zero, high was five. So that's my first index and my last index. Mid is going to be low plus high divided by two. What did I say that was going to be then? And then here it's going to say A at position mid. So whatever's in that box, is it higher than value? Va value must be whatever's actually held in these boxes, right? Otherwise, how can you compare it? So value is actually, I would, I would imagine it's the value you're looking for. You know, we, said, we suspected it might be a binary search. The more I'm looking at this, the more I'm thinking it is. Because what happens now? Well, now you're saying, ah, if it's higher than value, then send it the low, the original low you had, but now it's mid minus one. So it's removing half of the array and calling itself. If it's lower, if whatever's in the midpoint is lower than the, mid, than the value, then the value must be in the other section. So it's going from mid to high. So it's either going to be calling this section or this section. It's not a quick sort, but it is one of the algorithms. It's where you find the middle item. Is it higher than the middle item? So, if, Sorry, if the value is higher than the middle item, discard this side. If it's lower, then discard that side. That's a binary search. So that's what this is. It's a binary search. And it'll keep doing that. If the thing in the middle is neither higher nor lower, what must it be? It is the value unless the value wasn't in the list, I suppose, and then you return mid. So you return a mid. Is that a value or is that the position? Look what mid was. Position. So it returned the position of where it found the thing. Yes? So let's go back to describing. So what is is what was A? A was a array or list? Absolutely. We don't really know, do we? Array or a list? It doesn't make it clear really what the data structure is. What's value? What is value? In a binary search, what would the value be? Yeah, item we're looking for. The reason why I think you think it looks a bit like a quick search, a quick uh, sort though, is like that is also a recursive statement and you find a midpoint and you discard. It, it, it doesn't look the same, but there are similar, similar elements for sure. Low is, some people have written down different things, but what do we think low is? Do you remember it's a bit like, in the way I drew it, it's a bit like pointers. It's saying the lower end of the search, the lower index of the search, and the higher index of the search, right? It's not values. It's not the highest value or lowest value. It's the position. So we're going to say. I'd say the lower end, lower end uh, of list, brackets, the index. And the other one is going to be the higher end. Hopefully now that we've actually done these algorithms, some of these ones, hope, you know, it will actually ring a bit more of a bell when you look at it. You know what I mean? Now, Because now we've actually looked at this one, you know, over time, it's not going to be like, oh, what the hell is this thing? We make it clear. Recursion, two marker. What is it you think you need to say? How many marks do you get for that? So the first mark is a function that calls. No, so there's the concept of winding down. There is, but that's like a good and a bad. Bingo, that's it. That's the first. So first mark, a function that calls itself, and then the second mark is from within the function. One example of where we see recursion, being that we've just done this definition, tell them one, where's the one example? We said it's a function that calls itself within the function. Where do you see it? Uh, 
bingo, that one there, yeah. That's an example, isn't it? Because it's calling itself from within. So that one is acceptable, that one's acceptable, that's where it happens. I'm not gonna write it up, that's where we are. Rewrite the algorithm without using recursion, annotate your pseudocode with comments to show how it solves the problem. So this is the big Oh, oops. For this one here, let's just start with the basics to kick us off. What's the basic thing we're gonna get included for that first mark? What are we writing? Function. So let's put that in. And the name of the function and the parameters. How do we solve this problem? Let's think it through. What are we trying to do? We're trying to do a... What is the algorithm? It's a binary search. How is a binary search? Binary search works by having this lower bound and a higher bound, calculating the midway point, right? And then we've had the value we want to compare it to. Is it higher or lower? Now, because we're not doing it recursively, we're going to have to set a new lower Right, so it's either going to be in the higher bit or the lower bit, and then find the new midway point, compare it's higher and lower. Do we know how many, like, if we're not using recursion, what else can we make use of? A loop. So is it going to be a for loop or a while loop? Yeah. Do we know how many times it's going to go around? No, so it has to be a while loop. Um, how many times, when will it stop going around? So when it's found it. So what do you think we need? We need a flag called found. And we'll say at the beginning that's going to be set to what value? False. Now there's actually another easy mark to pick up. I don't know if you spotted it. What are they doing here? This bit here. If high less than low, then return error message. What's, why is it having to return an error message? It has to be higher, right? Otherwise, it's not going to work. Should we? Do we need to do that also in this iterative statement? Yeah. So guess what? Yeah. <laughs> okay, there we go. We've managed to ninja ourselves a few marks that way. I have to start writing smaller for this to fit in. We've got this found thing. So while what is true, keep the loop going around. So we said it was a while loop we wanted to use. So while... But you know what, I'm going to have to go smaller than this again, I've really... While found, yeah, is either not equal to true, yes, or is equal to false. Either way works. Maybe, I don't know, for some reason in my head it makes more sense to do it this way around, but I don't know if that's true. Because <laughs> I'm saying, well, I'm not waiting for it to be true, but, like if, what, if, but if you also say found is, equal to, is, is equal, equal to false, it still makes sense, because you're... Uh, wait until it becomes true. All right, then what do we do? What are we checking for? If what? Well, first of all, what's the midpoint? But we don't have it yet, do we? So the next thing we need to do is actually generate the midpoint, don't we? So how do we generate the midpoint? Yeah, mid equals high minus low. Yeah, if you do it low minus high, and like low is one and high is five, you mean minus four. So if we calculated the mid outside the while loop and we just calculated it once, aren't we gonna have to, we're gonna have to recalculate it? Because you think about it, we're gonna get half it, and then it's gonna have a new midpoint, half it, have a new midpoint. You see what I'm saying? So the midpoint's gonna have to be recalculated as we go along. So we're gonna have which way around high minus low, and then what else? High minus low, and then yeah, bingo. So we've calculated the midpoint, and we're almost at our, almost what we want to do. So in a binary search, let's come back to the, how the algorithm works, what we're checking for at the midpoint. If what? If A, but what about A? A at position is great. So we're going to do that way around first. In fact, we can go back to our little algorithm works for this, isn't it? Yeah? Is greater than value then what was our what was the solution on the uh, what was on the paper if it was higher then it's going to be mid minus then the new high is mid minus one you see that 
So that means that we need to make high, because that's what we changed here. High is going to become uh, mid minus one, because that's what changed here. It was the high became mid minus one. What happens to the low? Stays the same. So high equals mid uh, minus one. Anything else I need to change here? No, because then when it comes around, so if this was true, when it comes around, it's going to recalculate the mid, isn't it? I've got my new high, uh, but then it'll be the mid will be this new calculation and then see which side it's in. What's next? Else if what? Exactly. So we can lean on the work that's already been done saying it's smaller and we can come back to our little example here see when it was smaller then this time the lower one became what mid plus one so low becomes what does low become there you go oops mid plus one And then our final bit, it's going to be else. What's the final else going to say? If it's not higher or lower, it's either, it's either found it. Well, well, you say return mid, but first of all, we want to terminate this while loop. How do we terminate? There you go. I agree with you. Now, the, the one thing where I suppose this could throw a spanner in the works is what happens if uh, it's not in the list at all. Yeah, but then... I, the recursive one didn't catch that either. So I think maybe even said somewhere you can assume it's in the list. So we're saying, yeah, found equals true. And of course, whatever mid was last set to, that is going to end up being, it's still going to be holding it. So that when this while loop ends, we end up returning. Well, what do we end up returning when the while loop ends? Here you go. So we go, we end the while. I do apologize for this. I really have made a pig's ear of my uh, presentation. And while return, what are we returning again yet? You just said it was return mid. Of course, in the calm light of day, when we're talking it through, <laughs> four marks for writing it. Maximum four marks for writing it. And then another four marks for doing the annotation, for like doing the commenting, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, which is why I've put the screenshot, I've screenshot the mark scheme. So it says, rewrite the algorithm using recursion, annotate your pseudocode with comments to show how it solves the problem. Now, I feel like four and a fourth split is quite harsh, um, but it is what the mark scheme says, so that's what I've had to follow. So in here, at the end, isn't it? Oh, oh I do have it here. You can see that that's the uh, pseudocode that we've written out, which is roughly what we've done. But what we've got here is possible annotated comments. So I suppose it's worth knowing if it says comments, put comments in, <laughs> you know. Uh, so we say that, you know, it's, this is just examples. Uh, we, maybe we could say we use, we use the if, why, because if the high and the low is the wrong way around, we need to return that as being wrong. Uh, why do we use a flag called found? Well, the loop will continue until it has been found and becomes true. Why do we check if it was lower and higher? I mean, it's... It, I think it actually makes sense, but were you sitting there thinking, oh, it's eight markers, oh, four marks will be for the code and four marks will be the comments. If I was sitting in your shoes, I wouldn't be thinking that. But then it's, I think it's a good lesson to learn now that in the future, if we see comments, if you look at it, you could have actually really made a pig's ear of your commenting, couldn't you? Of your code. You could have done the function, you could have made one of the if statements work, the other one could have been wrong, right? Got two out of four marks, but you could have actually commented it correctly and got six out of eight marks. It's pretty mad when you look at it.